It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Acer XN253QX. As usual, this video accompanies a detailed written review, and you can find a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. As a video, what you see depends on my camera, it depends on the processing done by my video editing software and by YouTube, and ultimately on the screen that you're actually viewing the video on. So in no way does it represent exactly what the monitor will look like first hand. This monitor uses a full HD TN panel, that's 24.5 inches diagonally, and it uses a medium matte anti-glare screen surface. So this gives a little bit of a grainy look to the image, nothing extreme, no kind of heavy smeary graininess or an obvious strong sandy look as some matte screen surfaces unfortunately give but it does take a little bit of edge off the vibrancy and clarity potential. But it also handles glare well, as I'll show you shortly. So the pixel density of this is not incredible. As I said, it's a full HD monitor, so that's 1920 by 1080 pixels. So desktop icons are fairly large, UI elements are fairly large. You don't get a huge amount of desktop real estate. And the image doesn't have the same kind of clarity and detail levels you'd get from a higher pixel density. Nonetheless, it's not terrible in that respect either. It's, it's usable and it certainly helps drive high frame rates and that's really where this monitor shines. I'm now going to talk a bit about the external features of the monitor. It has a distinctive Predator design similar to other recent monitors in the series. So you've got a fairly angular look overall. The stand base is nice and solid. It has a good premium feel to it. It's got powder coated metal. It's sort of a dark grey colour and there's a quite a solid chunky matte plastic in the middle and there's a little Predator logo in the middle there as well. There's some stickers just showing off some of the key features of the monitor towards the left. You can take these off if you prefer so you don't have to have these little stickers there. I'm just keeping them on because this is a review sample and it's sort of polite to just leave the stickers on. So NVIDIA G-Sync and NVIDIA 3D Vision both supported. I'm not going to explore 3D Vision in this uh, review. It's not really something I use just generally I don't have the 3D Vision kit anymore, I used to have an NVIDIA 3D Vision 2 kit. And I used to test it in a few of the reviews, but it's not really a very requested feature and it's not really worth my time reviewing it. G-Sync, certainly will be looking at that. It also supports ULMB, but there's no sticker to uh, show that. The bottom bezel is a dark grey plastic. It's got a kind of little texture to it. You can probably see that in the video. Slight little textured appearance. And there's a shiny Silver Predator logo in the middle there. There's also a cable tidy loop towards the bottom of the stand face. The top and side bezels are much more slender. So it has a dual stage bezel design. It's something that Acer calls zero frame. And that means that there's a thin, hard plastic outer component. And there's also a panel border. So you can see that the panel border, it's slightly different shade to the rest of the screen, but it blends in quite nicely when the screen is off. You can see that panel border around the image when the screen is switched on and that will become clearer in other parts of the review. The screen surface is medium matte anti-glare, so that offers good glare handling. It's quite a bright room actually this, but uh, there's no real issues with glare. This in part a bit of graininess to the screen surface it has some other sort of implications for the image and that's explored elsewhere in the review. And just another small thing I'd like to point out, there are some calibration marks. Dual stage bezel designs like this, they often have calibration marks. And that's just for the machine that actually puts everything together to make sure they put everything in the right place and line everything up properly. So you can see there's a little sort of notch there. It's a bit lighter. Looks like a little bit of the, the panel board has sort of been removed. It's exactly the same on the other side as well. And perhaps not as clear because of the lighting. There's also a little dot towards that corner and a little dot towards that corner. All completely normal, not defects, so don't worry about that. The included stand offers good ergonomic flexibility. You can adjust the height of the monitor. You can pivot it into portrait. You can pivot it clockwise like I did there, or you can pivot it anti-clockwise if you prefer. It's a little bit stiffer that way, so I assume people haven't pivoted it that way as much, this particular sample. And just be aware, it is a TN panel, so if, if you're going to be wanting to use it in portrait, be aware of the viewing angle limitations. It's not really ideal for that. You can also tilt it backwards a fair bit, 
tilt it forward slightly and finally you can swivel the stand left and right. At the side the monitor is reasonably slim at the thinnest point and it bulks out where the stand attaches. You can see the quite robust stand design as well so it has a sort of very firmly planted tripod style base um, and as I said before that's powder coated metal so it has a nice sort of premium feel to it and there's also two USB 3 ports. The top port and has a little sort of battery icon there it supports fast charging for connected devices as well. At the rear of the monitor towards the left side you can see the OSD controls so there's a little joystick there and accompanying buttons and the OSD is explored in a separate video, so I'm not going to go through that now. There's the cable tied loop I mentioned before. There's also a little headphone hook. And if you just, so you just push the bottom there. And then that comes out. So you can pop your headphones on there. That's quite a neat little design. Just folds away like that very easily. And you can see that there's a sort of bluish grey stripe here as well and the another shiny Predator logo at the top. And there are a few different textures used, so it's mainly sort of plain matte black plastic and there's also a brushed textured matte black plastic used elsewhere. There's a Kensington lock slot, a K slot there, and the ports which are down firing. So some to the left of the stand, some to the right of the stand. And I'll come on to them very shortly, but just to mention first, there's also a quick release button which, which will allow quick removal of the stand from the screen, and that will reveal 100 by 100 millimeter Besser holes for alternative mounting. So the ports then, there's a power button there, zero watt power switch, on or off. There is an AC power input, which means there's no external power brick, it uses an internal power adapter. And towards the right side, there's a DisplayPort 1.2 input, and that supports the full functionality of the monitor, so 240Hz, NVIDIA G-Sync, that kind of thing. HDMI, that's really just there for compatibility with games consoles or other devices which are more limited in their capabilities. So you don't get the full refresh rate, you don't get any G-Sync capabilities. You're actually restricted to a 60Hz refresh rate at the native resolution using HDMI. So 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and there are two further USB 3 ports and a USB 3 upstream port. There are also some integrated speakers, simple 2 watt stereo speakers and they're explored a little bit in the written review so they just offer basic sound output, nothing special. I'm now going to move on to talk about the contrast performance of the monitor and one thing I like to talk about when it comes to TN models is perceived gamma shifts. And that is important when it comes to perceived contrast because the perceived gamma is a lot higher, higher up the screen and lower, lower down the screen. That means higher up the screen, things appear darker and more blended together, whereas lower down the screen, things appear lighter and more distinct. And that has an effect in terms of perceived contrast levels because it changes how dark scenes are represented. And my website here has a nice little sort of integrated test these kind of things can be quite difficult to show in a video, it doesn't really capture it as the eye would see it, but it certainly is easier to have a specific test for this kind of thing or something which sort of highlights it quite nicely in a video, whereas when I'm showing you games it's not always so obvious. So my website here it has a little kind of honeycomb mesh background for the header at the top there and also the footer at the bottom. So with the header being displayed at the top of the screen, you can see that the pattern is fairly well blended. There isn't a sort of a very distinct grey honeycomb mesh with the black background, it doesn't really stand out. But if you compare that to the footer, shown lower down the screen, and you can see the mesh there again for comparison at the top. It's a lot more distinct, and certainly to my eye it's a lot more distinct. The, the honeycomb pattern it really stands out in an obvious way. That's again because the perceived gamma is considerably lower, lower down the screen. And just to show, it is exactly the same pattern. So if I sort of make this a little window instead, and I kind of move it up and down the screen, so you can see it's sort of more blended towards the top, and it gets increasingly visible lower down the screen.
sort of centrally in the central mass of the screen, it's more or less as it should be displayed. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm going to continue to talk about the contrast performance of the monitor using in-game examples. So this title has plenty of scenes which demand a strong contrast performance, with lots of dark elements such as tombs and caves and dark passageways, with little bright elements sort of mixed in. So you can see that here with the fire there, the flames shooting out there, and also this sort of fiery skull thing here, surrounded by darkness. Now, as a TN model, the contrast isn't amazingly strong. I measured around 800 to 1, following the adjustments made to my test settings. So this is fairly close to the specified 1000 to 1, and you can get a bit close to that depending on the settings you're using, uh, but I wouldn't really worry about that particular difference. Either way, it's pretty typical for a TN model. So it doesn't have amazing contrast, it doesn't have a kind of inky look to darker shades, it doesn't have the sort of atmospheric look that a VA model with decent contrast would provide. But as a TN panel, rather than an IPS type panel, you don't have IPS glow to contend with, so things don't look flooded towards the corners of the screen, you don't get this kind of eating away at detail, particularly towards the bottom corners of the screen as you'd see on an IPS type panel. But as I had mentioned, using examples with my website before, the image does look deeper towards the top of the screen and things look more blended together, whereas further down the screen there's actually excessive detail in dark areas and things look less blended than they should. And that can give a kind of blocky or slightly banded appearance in places. That's not unique to this monitor. It's something you'll see on all TN models, comparing the bottom to the top of the screen. And you can see it with some in-game examples here as I move my mouse um, towards the top of the screen. There's a lot less detail, sort of a lot less distinct detail, whereas further down the screen, those same elements appear more distinct. And on this game, this has a bit of an effect in that there are some porous rock textures which aren't so clear towards the top of the screen if you observe them towards the top of the screen, whereas they're very clear further down the screen. But this model doesn't actually have the same kind of gamma shifts that some TN models have. Larger TN models, naturally, because they're larger, from a given viewing distance they will have more distinct shifts in gamma up and down the screen, and some 24-inch models have more pronounced gamma shifts than this. So the common 24-inch panel used, high refresh rate 24-inch panel, rather than the 24.5-inch panel, which is what this model uses, that has more distinct gamma shifts, so it has more extreme differences between the top and bottom of the screen. This one isn't as pronounced as that. They are definitely still there, and it's a typical TN characteristic. As I'd mentioned earlier, the screen surface has a little bit of a grainy look to it, it doesn't have the same kind of clarity and vibrancy potential as a lighter matte screen surface with a smoother screen surface texture. And it does give a little bit of a grainy look to these lighter shades, such as the fire there, or if I was playing in the daylight, you can see that in the sky and that kind of thing. But it's not too extreme, and it's something I'm quite sensitive to. Most users, I think, would find the level of graininess on this acceptable. I'm now going to move on to the colour reproduction. And I like to start, as usual, by looking at the legom.nl, that's the website, tests for viewing angle, and that's particularly important on a TN model such as this. And as I've mentioned, there are perceived gamma shifts which affect how darker content in particular is displayed, but also affects the representation of lighter shades, various different colours, for example. And the Legom text is good for showing this. So from a normal viewing position, you can kind of see it's has a greeny look to the striping of the text towards the top of the screen, whereas further down the screen it looks quite red, and there's a kind of transition with an orangey bit towards the middle, and as you move your head, that readily shifts. Again, that's typical for a TN model, and this shows that there's a fair viewing angle dependency to the gamma curve of the monitor. But you can also see this quite clearly when you're looking at solid shades on the monitor, the pink block here, the purple block, sorry, it uh, does appear largely pink on this monitor. It appears kind of purple towards the top, particularly in the central region, but it transitions to a much stronger pink hue further down, and that again shifts very readily with head movement. The red block appears quite a saturated deep red towards the top, but then it transitions to more of a faded red and then a pink hue 
lower down. And again, this shifts readily with head movement. There are some shifts horizontally as well, but they're not as pronounced. It's really the vertical viewing angle weaknesses which are more apparent on TM models like this. The green block appears fairly solid throughout. It does appear a bit of a sort of yellowish green, and that's because of the colour gamut of the monitor not being particularly broad. And that's something I'll talk about a little more with in-game examples. So it kind of appears yellowish green throughout. It doesn't have the same kind of distinct shifts, although if you move your head far enough, you will see there are some distinct shifts. It looks more sort of yellowish towards the bottom. And actually this shade displays more distinct shifts if you're looking at one of the TN models with more extreme um, gamma shifting, such as the 24 inch 144 hertz full HD TN models I was talking about before. That's pretty much every model which uses a 24 inch 144 hertz TN panel, including the view Sonic uh, models that I recommend. Now, blue block, as usual, it just appears quite a solid blue throughout. There are no kind of distinct shifts. You can observe some shifts in brightness here and there, uh, not on my particular unit. You might be able to see some shifts in brightness just because of uniformity issues, and that varies between individual units. It's not specifically related to viewing angle performance. I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. Overall the monitor has a fairly rich look once you've set it up correctly. It certainly looks richer than some TN models and one reason for that is that it doesn't have huge gamma issues centrally. Some TN models have uncorrectable gamma issues, you can't correct them through the OSD. This model, it doesn't have perfect gamma. Once corrected through the OSD, it was actually a little bit lower than I'd like, um, a little bit below the 2.2 target centrally. So I've actually applied an ICC profile, and you can find a link to that and an explanation of how to actually use that in the written review. But I wouldn't say this profile is essential. Things still look fairly rich without it. It just sort of lifts things up a little bit. Um, some shades appeared a little bit too dull without it. I wouldn't really say washed out, but just a bit darker and not as bright as they should appear. And as I mentioned before, there are some shifts in the saturation levels comparing the top and bottom of the screen, but they're less pronounced than on some TN models as I mentioned before. So you can see some fairly rich looking autumnal colours towards the top of the screen, but further down the screen they become a bit kind of more faded in their appearance. And I've positioned the camera so that it's a little bit higher up than the central line and that's to simulate the ergonomically correct viewing position where you should have your eyes sort of in line with the top third of the screen rather than the middle of the screen. But either way, you will see a shift um, comparing the top to the bottom of the screen. And you can see that with this fire here as well. It looks pretty vibrant um, towards the top of the screen, fairly rich in the centre of the screen, a bit less so lower down. But speaking of vibrancy, as I mentioned the screen surface before, it does affect the vibrancy potential, but really more critical to considering vibrancy on a monitor in general is the colour gamut. On this monitor it extends a little bit beyond sRGB in some regions, although it doesn't extend as much as some models, and that means that the vibrancy potential sort of isn't as great as it would be on a model with a wider colour gamut. But I would say things do look quite rich overall, quite natural, and they certainly don't look washed out, and that's the sort of fear that people have with some TN models. They can certainly look more vibrant with a more generous colour gamut, a lighter screen surface, that kind of thing, and more consistent colours from a different panel type, but really it's not something which you're gonna, most users are going to look at and think, oh this, is, this looks horrible and washed out. And I suppose I should mention in this section, there are various different gamma settings in the OSD, and they're explored in the OSD video, but just to quickly show you, None of these, as I mentioned, get spot on 2.2 without my ICC profile applied, although the default one does come fairly close, just sags a little bit at 2.1 on average. But there are various gamma settings, and if you change them, you'll find that the image does look quite different. So 2.5 looks rather deep. Gaming has very high gamma, so things look sort of far too deep, really. And there's a lot of clipping for the darker shades and you can't really see the distinct details where you should be able to see them. Some people do like that kind of look. But as I've mentioned before, some TN models have issues where gamma is always too low. 
they kind of look more like this all the time, even when you've corrected everything in the OSD as far as you can. And that really looks quite flooded. It might not, I mean, the, the camera kind of corrects for this to an extent, so it might not be such an obvious difference on the video, but really things just look just too bright, too blended together. There's really a, a distinct lack of richness anywhere. And some models have that. But this model, if you're using an appropriate gamma setting, and more so if you've got a full calibration, looks quite decent. I'm back on Battlefield 5, and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. This monitor uses a 240Hz TN panel, so with it being 240Hz, it's pumping out four times as much visual information every second as a 60Hz monitor and twice as much as a 120Hz monitor. I've also got the game running at 240 frames a second where possible. There are a few dips below that, but for the most part it's around 240 frames a second or certainly a very high frame rate. And This really gets the most out of the monitor and allows it to stretch its legs. So with this kind of refresh rate there are two main advantages. One advantage is that it has a very good connected feel and what I mean by that is the, the precision and the fluidity you feel when you're interacting with the game world. This is completely not something you'll be able to appreciate by watching a video, it's something you really just appreciate when you use a monitor like this or a high refresh rate monitor and you're running at a suitably high frame rate. And this connected feel really is excellent. There's a fluidity of precision that's just lacking at lower refresh rates. This kind of connected feel is very good at 144 frames a second, 144 hertz as well, certainly compared to 60 hertz. There's a bit of a step up to 240 hertz as well. And sensitivity to this does vary, but it's certainly something I can notice and competitive gamers might appreciate. Input lag is also an important aspect of connected feel. And this monitor has good low input lag. I measured around three milliseconds, so it's really not an issue with this. Even sensitive users will not find the input lag problematic with this monitor. The other aspect of the high refresh rate and high frame rate combination is that it greatly reduces perceived blur due to eye movement. There's an article on the website about monitor responsiveness which explores this concept in quite a bit of detail. There's also a bit of a summary in the written review. But essentially your eye movement creates a lot of the perceived blur you'll see on a monitor when you're observing moving content. The other aspect is pixel responsiveness, I'll come on to that shortly. But the overall perceived blur really very low. That keeps things looking sharp as you're moving rapidly and certainly relatively detailed and that gives you a good competitive edge. So really this kind of monitor, 240Hz, you do have to be running at really high frame rates to take advantage of the great levels of perceived blur and the very low connected feel, or to get the most out of the monitor I should say. So you're really looking at sort of competitive gameplay. This has a real edge over lower frame rates and refresh rates. Pixel responsiveness is also an important aspect of perceived blur and this monitor does very well in that respect as well. There are no standout weaknesses. All the generation 240Hz panels which I've tested, so the AOC AG251FG for example and the ViewSonic XG2540, I've reviewed them in detail on the website. I've also tested quite a few other 240Hz monitors but none using this sort of newer generation of panel like this one uses. And they certainly do seem to have actually sped up the pixel responses in general. The older models didn't have any massive weaknesses, but for some pixel transitions, particularly where there were lighter shades against darker backgrounds, such as I see here with the shooting trial text there and the icon there, that would create a kind of, a kind of powdery trailing. On this monitor, you don't get that. There is a little bit of overshoot though, so you can see it's sort of, or well, I can see, at least to my eye, a slight dark shadowy trail behind that white there. It's not obvious overshoot though, it's not a strong dirty trail as you might call it, it's just a little bit of dark overshoot. But this really isn't an eye-catching example of overshoot at all. There's also a little bit of overshoot in terms of halo trailing, bright trailing, but again nothing that really catches the eye too much. For example, at the side of the building here, there's a trail that's brighter than the background colour, the sky in the background, so it does sort of stand out a little bit against the background, but it really isn't strong overshoot. 
There are also various different pixel response time settings on the monitor. I'm using the normal setting, which is definitely optimal. If you refer to the written review, you'll see exactly why. But I'll just show you the extreme setting, just for a bit of a laugh. So it's here in the gaming section of the OSD overdrive. It's usually one word overdrive, but Acer likes to separate it into two words for unknown reasons. If you set that to extreme, you can see, let's make sure it's actually applied. You can see very strong overshoot. So you can see bright, colorful trails behind the, particularly behind that wall there, for example. There's a really quite a colorful artifacty look and there's sort of an, just a general over sharpening effect and I can see a lot of dirty trailing around the canisters there. Given how well optimized the normal setting is there's really no need for this. This isn't doing you any favors it's just introducing obvious overshoot around the leaves there as well and it's just not attractive at all. Setting the overdrive to off that's not a nice thing to do either because there's a lot of powdery trailing, a lot of sort of, some of users might even call it smeary. It's just not fast enough for 240 hertz performance at high frame rates. It's simply really no re reason to do this. Unless you're super sensitive to overshoot and you want absolutely zero overshoot. But to be honest, the overshoot with the normal setting is really too slight for it to be a big issue, um, I feel. and. I don't think any user would buy this monitor, a very fast monitor, only to completely gimp the pixel responses like this. So the normal setting, certainly preferable. And again, there's no way to appreciate this kind of aspect of the monitor fully in a video, um, but it certainly allows me to sort of go through it and talk you through it. Another aspect of this monitor is that it includes support for NVIDIA G-Sync on compatible GPUs. Without G-Sync enabled or without using a monitor with this kind of variable refresh rate technology. When the refresh rate and frame rate depart, so when the frame rate drops below 240 frames a second, for example, you would see obvious stuttering if you had VSync enabled or tearing and a juddering effect if you had VSync disabled. And you will notice that I do frequently get drops below 240. There's a frame rate counter in the top right. Um, it, doesn't stick, it doesn't stick to 240 frames a second. Except for titles which are really very easy for your graphics card to run and your system to run in general at this kind of frame rate consistently, you're really going to expect some drops below that. Um, certainly on Battlefield 5 you will get that. And this is just the shooting range, it's not very demanding on this game at all. There are always going to be dips below that. But with G-Sync, the refresh rate is always being dynamically adjusted to match the frame rate of the content where possible. So these dips are accounted for and you don't get tearing and stuttering from mismatches between the frame rate and refresh rate. I've increased the graphics settings a bit now and now you'll see that my frame rate does spend some time below 200 frames a second. There's a little bit of a drop off in connected feel and a bit of an increase in perceived blur because of that. But things really are very good in both respects still. And as usual, because G-Sync's active, you don't get the tearing and stuttering. So that's really nice. And to me, as someone who's sensitive to tearing and stuttering, if I had G-Sync disabled, I'd notice that immediately and it would kind of bug me quite a bit. And sensitive users would find the same thing. The kind of variable refresh rate technologies could be really wonderful to have for these kind of dips. I've increased the graphics settings further by increasing the resolution scale. So the rendering resolution's now been increased. And you'll see that my frame rate is actually around 144 on average, I'd say. So that now feels and looks very much like a 144 hertz monitor. I've got G-Sync enabled, so I don't get the tearing and stuttering. That's really nice. But the drop off in connected feel and the increase in perceived blur, yes, I do notice it. But what I would say is the difference between 240 hertz and 144 hertz is nowhere near the kind of difference you'll see and feel comparing 60 hertz to 144 hertz and of course I'll, I'll do that shortly because I'll increase the graphics settings further and try and decrease my frame rate even more but what I would say is for competitive gaming sort of the higher the frame rate the better but for most users I think they'd be kind of happy and um, when the game dips to this kind of level it's still in the comfortably in the, the triple digits and it really does give a nice connected feel and perceived blur level overall anyway.
just not quite as nice as the higher frame rates would give. I've increased the graphic settings further, actually pretty much as high as I can make them. And as I said, this scene is not particularly graphically demanding. There would absolutely be some further dips below this um, for some other scenes. But you can see that it's at least in the double digits now. And there is a drop off in connected feel and the perceived blur levels are certainly higher than they are at much higher frame rates. But again, G-Sync's doing its thing, getting rid of tearing and stuttering. So that's really nice. And if the frame rate dips further, um, I can't show you that in this particular scene, but if it dips below 30 hertz, that's actually the floor of hardware operation for any G-Sync monitor. And that means that the monitor will not be able to set its refresh rate lower than 30 hertz uh, if the frame rate drops below 30 frames a second, that is. But what it will do is it will stick to a multiple of the frame rate with its refresh rate. And that will keep tearing and stuttering at bay by using exact multiples. And that works very nicely. Although I would say the connected feel is awful at that kind of low frame rate. And the level of perceived blur is rather extreme. So it's not a nice place to be. On 240 hertz monitor, if you're at that kind of frame rate, you're really doing something wrong. The monitor also supports ULMB, ultra low motion blur. This can't be used at the same time as G-Sync. As usual, this is a strobe backlight setting and it replaces G-Sync with compatible NVIDIA GPUs and it's designed to minimise motion blur as much as possible. This isn't a very nice thing to show you in a video because all you'll see is the monitor sort of flickering a bit. You will not be able to appreciate the improvement in motion clarity. But I do explore ULMB in the written review so refer to that if you want some useful photography showing what that does and also some sort of descriptions of how it affects the gameplay. But I would say in general, 240 hertz, if you're able to get a really high frame rate, it's really nice to have. G-Sync is just nice to have in general. But some competitive gamers where they're really after the lowest possible level of perceived blur, if you're playing games where you're able to solidly match the frame rate and refresh rate, so you can get, say, 144 frames a second very solidly, and you want the lowest level of perceived blur there, then absolutely try ULMB. Some users really like it, strobe backlight settings like that. And the ULMB implementation is, is actually quite good on this model. So to wrap up then, this monitor has a nice solid build to it, I feel. It has a fairly premium feel because of the use of powder coated metal on the stand and the pretty robust stand design. It has quite an angular look, really quite typical for Acer Predator models. It doesn't have any sort of bright, colorful features, so it doesn't look too sort of in your face gamery. Um, in my opinion, so that's quite nice as well. In terms of the contrast performance, really quite typical for a TN model. Nothing spectacular in that respect, but doesn't have IPS glow to contend with, so that's quite nice. There are, however, perceived gamma shifts, and they affect the perception of dark shades and how masked they appear, with them appearing more masked further up the screen and less masked lower down the screen. The screen surface is medium matte anti-glare, so it has a little bit of a grainy look to it, but it's not extreme. It doesn't have a sort of heavy smeary quality to it or a overly sandy look to it when you're looking at lighter content. But it could be certainly a bit smoother and a bit clearer. But this kind of screen surface is entirely typical for full HD high refresh rate TN models. In terms of colour reproduction, the monitor's colour gamut extends a little bit beyond sRGB but it doesn't reach any extremes of, of wider gamuts, and it certainly doesn't reach the kind of levels that some monitors reach these days, especially HDR monitors with around DCI-P3. Color space coverage, there's nothing like that. This is a little bit of extension beyond sRGB. This invites a little bit of extra vibrancy for sRGB content, a little bit of extra saturation. Overall, the image does look quite rich, and that's helped by the fact that the monitor doesn't have awful gamma handling. It has various different gamma settings you can tweak in the OSD. None of them on my unit quite reached the 2.2 target, so I did actually end up applying an ICC profile and fully calibrating to correct for that. But I would say even without the ICC profile, you don't get that kind of washed out look you get on some TN models in particular with issues with the central gamma. It's not just TN models this applies to, actually. Um, they're, they're often picked on for that kind of thing, but really any monitor with problems where the gamma is too low, uh, centrally, it can sort of wash the image out.
As a TN model, there are some shifts in gamma, as I mentioned before, with respect to contrast. They also affect the saturation levels and how you will perceive colours on the monitor. Higher up the screen, things look deeper and a bit more saturated, whereas lower down the screen, they appear a lot less saturated, more muted. And you might say, I wouldn't say washed out necessarily, but just compared to the top of the screen, there's certainly a noticeable difference in saturation. And if you calibrate the monitor really nicely, like I've done here, the shades will look more or less correct in the central bulk of the screen. The viewing angles are actually a bit improved though, compared to your typical 24 inch 144 hertz TN model. And they show more extreme shifts comparing the top and bottom to the screen and certainly do look rather flooded towards the bottom of the screen. This monitor is more consistent than that. And that's a comment I'd give to the 24.5 inch panels in general of, of the high refresh rate variety. But where this monitor really shines and really its key selling points come from the responsiveness. It has a 240Hz refresh rate which it puts to very good use, has low input lag and has really nicely tuned pixel responses, very rapid pixel responses. So it makes a very good use of that 240Hz refresh rate at high frame rates. It also supports NVIDIA G-Sync. That does its thing to get rid of tearing and stuttering as the frame rate dips below what would be the static refresh rate of the monitor. And as usual for G-Sync, it uses variable overdrive. I didn't really mention this in the responsiveness section. And that means that the monitor is adjusting its overdrive impulse, the voltage surge levels, as the refresh rate changes, so as the frame rate of your content's changing. And that avoids the introduction of increasingly obvious overshoot as your frame rate dips. That's something which FreeSync models don't use, and it's something which they have an issue with, with the overshoot becoming rather obvious at lower frame rates. G-Sync models like this are way nicer in terms of their tuning in that respect. And the overshoot levels in general, really not a big issue at all on this monitor. There is some overshoot. You do see a little bit of bright halo trailing and a little bit of dirty trailing, although really not very much. Nothing that most users I think would find eye-catching or bothersome. It also supports ULMB and that worked nicely as an alternative to G-Sync for users who like strobe backlight technologies. But a few issues which I sort of discuss in the written review, which I didn't really talk about here. And one of them is the issue of interlace patterns, interlace pattern artifacts. Some people might refer to them as scan lines. And what that means is the image kind of breaks up into a slightly lighter and slightly darker variant of the intended shade. This monitor does have dynamic interlace patterns, so you can see them or certain users will see them if you're sensitive to this kind of thing and you're looking at uh, sort of moving content, you're playing games, that kind of thing. I wouldn't say they're a massive issue on this monitor, although I, I am sensitive to them and I certainly did notice them. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, or even if you do, I would definitely recommend reading the appropriate section of the written review for more about this, because I know it does bother some users. It's something which I've noticed on all 24.5 inch high refresh rate TN models. And it's something which I've actually noticed just more generally on many high refresh rate monitors. So it's certainly not unique to this model. Overall then, I feel in terms of the speed, this monitor really is quite a speed demon. It doesn't have amazing image quality, you know, it doesn't have an amazing pixel density, awesome color reproduction, awesome contrast, but it certainly is passable in, in those sort of key areas. And it certainly offers some improvements in color reproduction over some TN models. So that's really all there is to the Acer XN 253QX. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.